Throughout history, no creature, mythical or otherwise, has achieved such an iconic status as the mighty dragon. Across nearly every culture and time, children and adults alike have told tales of fire-breathing monstrosities that terrorized the skies, and often of the noble warriors who set out to slay them. But what if these stories were more than just fantasy? How might a world populated by reptilian megafauna have been altered as a result of their existence? These are the questions posed by Vicus Rao, the author of a staggeringly detailed world-building project known simply as Draconology. Through numerous pieces of digital art and incredibly intricate descriptions, Draconology gives an account of the origin of dragons all the way through to the modern day. In this world, not only do dragons exist, but they live in a planet that has undergone a very different history, and as such, differs from our own on a fundamental level. It is here, on this alternate Earth, that Draconology gives these legends new and vibrant life. So today, dear traveler, we'll embark on a journey to that alternate world, where we'll find the answer to a question that has long filled humanity with childlike wonder. What if dragons were real? It goes without saying that dragons have long been associated with fantasy. Images of knights in shining armor, mystical flying serpents, and fables of fiery destruction come to mind. But the reality, though less fantastical, is no less astounding. Modern dragons can be classified into five distinct clades, sea serpents, worms, wyverns, drakes, and draconia, which includes both griffins and true dragons. In this two-part video, we'll explore just a few of these magnificent and dangerous creatures in detail, and we'll begin by diving into a location you may not expect to find a dragon, the deep ocean. Though they are certainly a type of dragon, the sea serpents aren't closely related to the other members of its family tree. Because these creatures spend most of their time at great depths, the eleven species that make up this family are rarely seen and poorly understood. What we do know is that they are masters of the deep, their laterally flattened tails provide powerful locomotion, and their limbs, modified into flippers, provide stabilization. One such serpent, the Nakaiwa, or lizard shark, can be found throughout the Pacific, Indian, and Southern Oceans, and at 6 to 7 meters in length, it's one of the smaller members of its clade. Its compact body, streamlined flippers, and rigid spine allow it to achieve speeds of up to 27 miles per hour. And though they are capable of diving to depths of around 300 meters, they prefer to spend most of their time nearer to the surface, where they feed on small fish and krill, much like baleen whales. Whales, in fact, are part of the reason most members of this lineage adapted to become deep-diving inhabitants of the benthic zone. By separating themselves from seals, whales, and other marine reptiles, they were able to flourish. But of course, their success is due, in part, to numerous other adaptations. Perhaps most notable is their secondary palate, which completely separates their nasal passage from their oral passage and allows them to swallow food while underwater. They also possess lingual salt glands which excrete excess salt and extremely dense bones that make diving easier. Now, if you look a bit deeper, we're drawing near to a much larger serpent. Reaching lengths of up to 21 meters and weighing more than 5 tons, the Tiamat is among the largest extant reptiles in the world. Since the times of ancient Mesopotamia, a giant serpent with the same name has been associated with primordial chaos, and when you see the reality for yourself, it's easy to see why. This serpent generally prefers the open ocean, far from the coasts, so sightings are rare indeed. Its size means that it's able to tackle giant cephalopods, medium-sized whales, and even sharks. In short bursts, it can swim just as fast as its smaller cousin, but with the added power of its bulk and a mouthful of curved, serrated teeth. Its coloration allows it to blend in with the darkness of the waters where it hunts, up to 1,500 meters below the surface. Like most sea serpents, the Tiamat has small, elongated lungs, used more to regulate its buoyancy than for storing oxygen. For the latter, they instead rely on a combination of a modified, highly vascularized gular sac rich in blood-filled papillae, and cloacal respiration, much like a sea turtle. Interestingly though, despite its size, the Tiamat is not a true apex predator. Smaller individuals frequently fall prey to great whites, other marine reptiles, and on one occasion, an individual was documented being killed by a pod of orcas, which took turns ramming the animal and tearing off its flippers. But of course, these aren't the only otherworldly creatures in the sea. Sometimes, sea serpents will give chase to another near-mythical species, a type of marine primatomorph collectively known as merfolk. 
you're probably already familiar with the concept of a mermaid. They are, after all, nearly as ubiquitous in human culture as the dragon itself. Beautiful fish-human hybrids with long flowing hair who seek to lure sailors to their watery doom. But like the dragons we've already glimpsed, the reality of these creatures is far more believable. They're members of Primatomorpha, a group that includes terrestrial primates. In the sea, they're represented by Tritonotheria, or more commonly, as merfolk. At a glance, their lineage can be confusing. Several species seem to be related to manatees or seals, but they're more closely related to colugos. They even retain their ancestors' dentition, though in these marine descendants, teeth are used to filter zooplankton and krill rather than for grooming. Somewhere along the line, this lineage lost their hind limbs, save for minor vestigials in some species, trading them for a fluked tail and a hydrodynamic body plan. Their forelimbs became webbed but lost none of their dexterity, an ability that remains very useful for grasping, manipulating, and even pulling themselves onto dry land. Merfolk are divided into three families. The Selkies, streamlined and agile macro predators seemingly straight out of Scottish legend, the sea trolls, which almost resemble elephant seals, and the sea monkeys, which generally feature short faces, forward-facing eyes, long forelimbs, and significant sexual dimorphism. This latter family is the one to which the most famous species belongs, the myrrh. Females of the myrrh species can reach lengths of three meters and are appropriately called mermaids. Males can reach four meters and are often called mermen or tritons. Found in temperate, subtropical, and tropical waters worldwide, these mystical creatures live in family pods of four to ten individuals and are most active during the day. Merfolk are also fast, able to swim at speeds up to 24 miles per hour. Still, unfortunately, this agility isn't enough to escape most predators. For protection, merfolk will often travel with larger creatures, like mantas or, occasionally, pods of dolphins. Interestingly, merfolk aren't only found in the ocean. The Ayara is a species found in freshwater and is native to the Amazon and Orinoco rivers. As a result, it's quite a bit smaller than its oceanic cousins at 1.4 to 2 meters in length. This, combined with its even more articulate forelimbs, allows it to more easily navigate the dense brush often found in these river environments. But while the merfolk are fascinating, for now, we'll return to our survey of the reptilian inhabitants of this strange and fascinating world. We've already discussed the sea serpents, but in these dark waters there is more than one kind of dragon to be found. As you may have noticed, the world of draconology is vast and intricate and connected by lineages stretching back for countless millennia. Building a world this complex is rewarding, but difficult to say the least. The more you flesh it out, the more complicated it becomes to keep track of everything. But with World Anvil, even the most complex world building is a breeze. With its robust tools, you can write up detailed accounts for each of your species, races, and regions, and use the built-in autolinker function to keep track of how they relate to or descend from one another. Or you can start by importing a detailed map and then link each of your species' profiles to their geographic location, making it easy to visualize your creations from a planetary view. Plus, World Anvil is always adding new features. One of the more recent additions is a feature called Chronicles, which takes some of the aspects of one of my favorite features, the Timeline Creation Tool, and allows you to connect important events with their location on a map. You can even link articles such as your species profiles to these world events and their locations, which can take your creation from a dull sequence of events to a living, breathing, fully interconnected world. And once you've forged your sci-fi, fantasy, or spec evo world, all of your entries are completely searchable. Gone are the days of documents, scattered folders, and tough-to-navigate online threads. With World Anvil, the only thing holding you back is your own imagination. So if you want to try out World Anvil for yourself, just visit worldanvil.com and enter code THOUGHTPOTATO at checkout for a whopping 40% off an annual plan. So whether you're a novelist, a dungeon master planning your next campaign, or looking to create an alternate Earth populated by mythical creatures, if you've had an idea for a world-building project and just haven't figured out where to start, check out World Anvil today and get started. Links are in the description. At first glance, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the members of Therasuchia look very similar to crocodilians or monitor lizards, and with armored skin and elongated snouts in some species, there is certainly a resemblance. But in fact, the 20 species that make up this lineage are the closest relatives of true dragons, a group we'll be seeking out in due time. But despite their close relation and extraordinary diversity, overall, drakes bear little resemblance to true dragons. The one thing several species do share, however, is the iconic ability to breathe fire. Our journey now takes us to southern Asia, 
where we just might glimpse our next species roaming in small packs through the forest. The aptly named Oriental Forest Drake is a relatively small member of its family, at 3 to 3.7 meters in length, but it's notable for the flare of color that runs along its sailed back, as well as a unique, nearly opposable digit on its front and back legs, very reminiscent of a primate. An adaptation like this, paired with a broadly omnivorous diet, has made this species very successful, even in a landscape filled with other, larger predators. And when it comes to large predatory drakes, none are as colossal as the mighty titan. Though you may rarely find this species on land, the titan drake is actually a marine reptile. It can much more easily maneuver its massive 13 to 15 meter 9 ton tank of a body through the water, where its thick skin and underlying layers of fatty tissue allow the titan to hunt in colder, deeper regions than its tropical cousins. And with serrated conical teeth and a bite force of 7 tons, it's a formidable predator on both the land and the sea. Interestingly, though, the titan drake prefers to dine on schools of small fish. An expandable gular sac allows them to suction feed by taking in a large volume of water along with a large volume of fish, and then simply expelling the water out between their teeth while the serrations keep the fish within its mouth. Of course, as previously mentioned, drakes are capable of breathing fire, a concept which we'll revisit in much more detail very soon. For a marine reptile, though, this ability is practically useless. But with a lineage as diverse as Therosuchia, there is much more to discover. Though several species have adapted to an aquatic lifestyle, none are more specialized for life in the water than Thaladoraptoridae, often called the sea drakes. The six known species of sea drake are found in tropical and subtropical waters worldwide, and these species are agile and streamlined, far more so than a more basal lineage like the titan. Like the sea serpents, sea drakes possess dense bones and thick skin, which allows them to dive more easily and regulate their temperature in cold water, respectively. And hollow scales connected to nerve endings allow these drakes to detect vibrations. Of course, unlike their less specialized cousins, sea drakes have lost the useless ability to breathe fire, but they've retained their forked tongues and well-developed legs, the latter of which allows them to remain quite mobile on land. This ability specifically is likely what's allowed the sea drakes to thrive, even amongst stiff competition from whales and other marine reptiles. Though there are many species of sea drake, the most common and well-known is the Makara. Found in tropical and subtropical regions of the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, the Makara's four-meter-long silhouette is often glimpsed sailing just below the water's surface. It exhibits many very specialized adaptations that make it the fastest drake by far. With a combination of a hydrodynamic body plan, including a tall nuchal crest that acts like a dorsal fin, webbed flipper-like feet, lightweight bones, and a strong tail, the Makara can reach speeds of 40 miles per hour, but only in short bursts. However, even with these adaptations, the Makara, like many other marine reptiles, isn't safe from predation by orcas and larger drakes. But now, dear traveler, we'll turn our attention from the dark depths of the ocean. The time has come to seek out the most famous and iconic dragons of all, Eudraconia, or the True Dragons. Eudraconia is the third most diverse clade of Draconomorpha, and it dates back to the late Jurassic. All true dragons possess teeth, have longer tails, shorter wrists, and a different bone structure than some of their closest relatives, namely the griffins, a lineage we'll be exploring in part two. You might think that these dragons are covered in scales, which is a safe assumption. But these scales are actually modified coelophybers, very similar to what you'd find on a pangolin. All members are obligate carnivores, with most species burning their prey before consuming it. Indeed, while species in two other clades have retained the ability to breathe fire, none have refined it to the level found in true dragons. Nearly all pyrosaurians, which includes drakes, griffins, and true dragons, have an apparatus consisting of a pair of structures associated with fat storage connected to highly derived submandibular glands. Collectively, these organs are referred to as the pyrogenic glands. These unique organs give them the ability to breathe fire, or more accurately, spit fire. And the idea isn't too far-fetched. In reality, all vertebrates are made of and produce large amounts of substances that are highly flammable under the right conditions. Methane, hydrogen sulfide, oils, and even body fat. Our bodies also frequently contain inorganic substances like metals and metal salts, which can react violently with air or water. At some point in their lineage, pyrosaurians lost the ability to effectively metabolize nitrogen, and so adapted to storing excess nitrogen in their fat reserves. Eventually, their submandibular glands fused with these lipid-containing fat deposits and became something more complex. 
all extant pyrosaurians irrespective of whether they can breathe fire possess a gene that encodes a mutated salivary enzyme that functions as an oxidase and this enzyme speeds up oxidation reactions by accelerating the oxidation of iron sulfide to produce iron oxide and hydrogen sulfide an immense amount of energy is released as heat while this is not excessively hot given the very small quantities in which these substances are produced it is enough to ignite acetone as well as further destabilize the nitrolipids the end result is a chemical mixture that undergoes a violently exothermic reaction upon contact with oxygen in the air and produces fire but of course to avoid burning themselves this ability requires some further very specific adaptations a modified hyoid apparatus enables pyrosaurians and especially you draconians in which this modification is the most advanced to propel their pyrophoric fuel mixture outward with enough force to clear their mouth and face and tube-like openings on either side of their mouths keep the flow highly directional this works so well that a fairly modestly sized dragon two to three meters long can easily spray a target at least three meters away while larger dragons can spray anywhere from ten to twenty meters away but there's more thanks to the level of precise muscular control they have over their pyrogenic glands true dragons in particular can use their fire in two different ways bursts and jets bursts are produced when a small amount of fuel is ejected so fast that it aerosolizes rapidly spreading as it burns and creating an intensely hot ball of fire interestingly though burns are not particularly dangerous as they have very little to no force so whatever damage they do inflict is purely due to heat this method is far less effective for hunting than it is for defense and it's the only method of which drakes are capable jets only produced by true dragons thanks to a specialized reaction chamber surrounded by muscle can shoot much further and do much more damage especially when a victim is doused in the continuously burning pyrophoric fluid but other than attack defense and sexual displays why breathe fire at all well for one in true dragons it allows for a much shorter digestive system than the other predators in their size class burning prey prior to feeding not only kills off parasites and removes fur feathers and scales it also makes the meat easier to digest by breaking down tough collagen and tenderizing bone and sinew in general eudraconian's bones are lightweight but not hollow like those of birds in composition they're unlike any extant flying animal but interestingly they are similar to those of the extinct hatsigopteryx eudraconia is divided into several families and subgenera and its species are extraordinarily diverse especially in size one of the smallest of these is the green dragonette with a wingspan of just seventy five centimeters it's around the size of a small hawk and found only in the solomon islands but though it may be small its ability to breathe fire means that it has few predators to find a slightly larger dragon we'll be traveling to eurasia here dominating both the land and sky is the iconic eurasian mountain devil its wings stretch up to fifteen meters or forty nine feet and it stands five meters in height tall enough to look a giraffe in the eye with a dragon this large it's no surprise that its prey is also large bison horses musk oxen and even juvenile elephantids all have to keep a lookout for the devil's immense shadow you might not think a dragon of this size would be agile on the ground but the eurasian mountain devil is quite adept at running and even hunts this way when stalking slower prey still they are at their most deadly from the air if they play it just right their unfortunate victims will be engulfed in flame without ever having seen it coming but now we'll travel to a place you've probably never heard of and with good reason made up of two large islands and over three hundred smaller ones lemuria is a microcontinent that doesn't exist in our world it's here in these highly productive aquatic ecosystems that we'll find our next species the lemurian dracolisk like the mountain devil it's a sizable dragon with a wingspan of around fourteen meters but unlike its primarily highland dwelling relative the lemurian dracolisk occupies a semi-aquatic niche its main prey items are the fish that swim through the abundant rivers and wetlands of lemuria and it's developed a few adaptations to match despite its preferred diet ironically the lemurian dracolisk is a poor swimmer it walks along the riverbed similar to a hippopotamus and ambushes prey by launching itself forward with its powerful forelimbs like most true dragons it burns its prey prior to consumption though not immediately after capture instead it swallows any prey it encounters stores it in a throat pouch and then regurgitates it on land where it then burns it before eating it specialized air sacs allow it to hold its breath under water for nearly an hour but of course this stored air makes it difficult to dive to counter this the dracolisk swallows numerous rocks similar to many diving animals and then spits them back out when it needs to fly 
Interestingly, this species is the longest living of all dragon species, mainly because even into old age when it and most other dragons become too heavy to fly, the Lemurian dracolisk remains fully capable of hunting. Indeed, the oldest dragon on record was a Lemurian dracolisk, which died at the age of 230. Now, dear traveler, we'll move our attention to the open woodlands, wetlands, and mountain forests of Asia. It is here that we'll find the Asiatic serpentine dragon, a member of the Neo Draconidae, a family that was once very similar to Eudraconids, but has gradually specialized to the forests and woodlands they call home. With ornate features, great adaptability, a wingspan of around 7 meters, and a number of different color morphs, the Asiatic serpentine dragon is truly a sight to behold. Males are notable for having a pair of elongated bony crests, which are extensions of the parietal bone, as well as a beard of fine skethers, similar to that of bearded dragons. Perhaps most notable, however, is this species' mating ritual. Their breeding season generally coincides with spring or monsoon season, depending on the dragon's home region. During this time, several males will gather together and begin bellowing to attract a mate, emitting a deep, booming call that can be mistaken for thunder. This could be why many Asian cultures associate the dragon with an ability to control the weather. Carried along a similar wind, we will now journey to the skies above Africa, where we will see one of the most impressive dragons so far. It's not necessarily its size, which with a wingspan of 9 to 10 meters isn't exactly small, nor is it its unique hood, which is formed by flaps of skin and used for defensive threat displays, much like a cobra. No, the Den Wen's most distinguishing ability is that, among all the dragons, it breathes the hottest fire known to exist. In fact, to the ancient Egyptians, a dragon with a similar name was thought to produce a fire so powerful, it threatened to immolate the gods themselves. In slightly more measurable terms, for comparison, the fire of most dragons burns at roughly 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius. By contrast, the Denwen produces fire that burns at a scorching 2,000 degrees Celsius, comparable to an acetylene blowtorch. While a direct blast from most dragons would cause instant third or fourth degree burns and char skin and flesh, a direct blast from a Denwen instantly burns straight to the bone. This frighteningly hot fire is due to a high concentration of nitrocarbons in the fuel that this species produces. Unlike regular hydrocarbons such as ordinary lipids or fats, when these pyrophoric substances burn, they produce little to negligible amounts of water vapor which would reduce the temperature of the flame produced. But while its fire burns hot, the Denwen can't do it for long, lest it run the risk of depleting its chemical stores. As with everything in life, there is a careful balance to be struck. And so, dear traveler, in an effort to maintain a similar balance, we must take an intermission. We'll resume our survey of the fascinating world of draconology in part two, where our journey will lead us to even more fascinating dragons, and maybe just a few of the bizarre creatures that live alongside them. Until next time, thanks for joining me, and remember, you matter. <laughs>